Hello and welcome to the Stone Church Bible Study. I'm Reverend Terrence, one of the pastors here in this church community. So as you know by now, over the course of the past few weeks, we have been looking at all of the I am sayings in the Gospel of John. And in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, I am quite a bit. He says things like, I am the light of the world, and I am the gate, and I am the good shepherd. And every time he says, I am, Jesus discloses some facet, some aspect of his identity, of his character. So this is now the very last Bible study in this Bible study series. And we're going to be looking at the occasion when Jesus says, I am the true vine. I am the true vine. So we'll unpack what that means. Before we do that, though, I will say this. If this Bible study was at all a blessing to you, if it was helpful to you in your walk of faith, please leave a like. And if you want more from Stone Church, more services, more Bible studies, more sermons, then please subscribe. Okay, with that out of the way, let's get started. Jesus is in the upper room with his disciples. These are his final moments with them. And Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine grower. So what Jesus is doing here is this. He's setting up a parable. And I like to define a parable basically as a simple story about ordinary things, or even just a description about ordinary things, like say, for example, the catching of fish, or the sowing of seeds, or the baking of bread, and so on. However, in a parable, each of these ordinary things all point to a deeper, shall we say, kingdom reality, moral reality, spiritual truth. So here, Jesus is talking about ordinary things that everybody recognizes. A grapevine, the branches that grow off of that grapevine, the grapes themselves, and so on. And each of these things correspond to a deeper truth. The grapevine, for example, corresponds to Jesus. And the vine grower, or the farmer, if you will, corresponds to God. Now, Jesus doesn't just get this parable out of nowhere. He draws his inspiration from the Holy Scriptures. Specifically, he draws his inspiration, I think, from a passage from the book of Isaiah about a vineyard. And in order to understand really what Jesus is talking about here when he says, I am the true vine, I think it's really important that we go back to that passage from Isaiah that makes reference to a vineyard. So listen to what the prophet Isaiah writes. My friend had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He spaded it, cleared it of stones, and planted the choicest vines. Within it, he built a watchtower and hewed out a wine press. Then he waited for the crop of grapes, but it yielded rotten grapes. Why, when I waited for the crop of grapes, did it yield rotten grapes? In the context of the book of Isaiah, it's clear that the vineyard planted on the fertile hillside represents the nation of Israel, God's chosen people. And like any good vine grower, God finds a fertile land to establish his vineyard. He breaks the soil, he removes stones, and finally, he sows seed on the land. And what God hopes to achieve here is obvious. God wants a vineyard that bears fruit. He wants a vineyard that produces grapes, that produces wine. He wants a vineyard, in short, that's lucrative. So in other words, God wants his people, Israel, to bear fruit, the fruit of righteousness, the fruit of justice and peace. And in this way, Israel will be a source of profound blessing to the rest of the world. Now, the problem, according to Isaiah, is this. Israel fails to bear fruit. In fact, Israel bears bad fruit. As Isaiah writes, it yielded rotten grapes. Now, keep that in mind as we go back to our passage from John chapter 15. Jesus says, I am the true vine. And I think that word true is very, very important. Last week, we talked about how true doesn't just mean objectively real, it also means trustworthy, faithful, reliable. Jesus is the one who faithfully, in obedience to God's will, produces the fruit of righteousness, justice, and peace. So what do we learn here? Well, 
we learn that Jesus succeeds where Israel has failed. Israel failed to produce fruit. But Jesus, because of his fidelity to God the Father, does bear fruit. In that sense, he is the true vine. But I don't want to target Israel. I don't want to, to say anything disparaging about Israel that I wouldn't also say about the rest of humanity because the truth of the matter is all of humanity has failed. All of the nations have failed to produce the kind of fruit that God wants to see in humanity. We've all fallen short. But Jesus doesn't. So God is the owner of the vineyard. He's the farmer, if you will. Jesus is the true vine. He is the faithful vine. Let's read on. Jesus says, He, that is God, removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. So here, Jesus adds two new objects to our parable. We have the branches, which grow from the vine, and also the fruit or the grapes that the, the branches bear. The branches clearly represent disciples of Jesus, followers of Jesus. And all of these many branches basically have one thing in common. They are all bound to the vine. They are all bound to Christ. And they draw nutrients and life and sustenance from him. And I think this is what makes the church a true community. I'll put it this way. As a Christian, I am not an individual autonomous unit following Jesus entirely on my own. No, insofar as I am bound to Jesus, I'm also bound to his other followers as well. I'm bound to all of those other branches through the vine that we have in common. So, and I'll say more about this later, that's why it's so important for every Christian to find her place in some expression of Christian community, in some local church community. It's very important um, to actively serve in a local church. In fact, I think that being part of a church community is what helps me, for example, as a branch to bear fruit. And that raises the question, what does the fruit in this parable represent? What are the grapes? Well, based on what we read in these few chapters of John's Gospel, I think the fruit represents, among other things, a life of Christ-like self-sacrificial service. One could even see the fruit as good deeds that spring forth from a living and active faith. But what we learn from the parable is this, and this is the sad truth, not all branches bear fruit. Anybody who tends grapevines could probably tell you this. And anyone with eyes and a brain could tell you that not every so-called disciple of Jesus produces the fruit of genuine, self-sacrificial, Christ-like love. In fact, some, some of them pr produce poisonous fruit. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Predators, as we know, have found their way into the Christian community, and, and some of them have done a great deal of damage there. You know, and I'm, I'm thinking specifically of, I guess you could say, uh, crises that have happened in the church in the past involving sexual abuse and, and, and exploitation and that sort of thing. So needless to say, there is a note of judgment in this verse. Indeed, the Lord says that his father will, and I quote, remove every branch in me that bears no fruit. Remove every branch in me that bears no fruit. These branches are not only useless, but they also consume nutrients from the vine that could otherwise feed productive branches. Therefore, they need to be cut off. Now, does that mean that the productive branches are off the hook? Well, not necessarily. Even they are worked on. And I want you to listen to what Jesus says next here. He says, Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. What does that mean? Well, I think it means that as long as we are still alive, as long as we are on this side of the resurrection in this earthly life, God is going to call us to ever higher levels of purity and hence fruitfulness. I don't think that on the day of our baptism or whenever our journey in Christ begins, I don't think we can say on that day, all right, I made it. Here I am, a fully formed disciple of Jesus. I am a perfect and immaculate, 
reflection of the character of Christ with no further need of repentance and no further need to grow in my faith? Of course not. Far from it. You know, when we begin our journey with Christ, whether on the day of our baptism or the day of our conversion or whatever, that on that day, God is just beginning his work. Sure, as branches, we've been grafted onto the vine. Sure, we may even be bearing fruit. But God wants to prune us. God wants to cleanse us so that we bear even more fruit. Now, the question is, how does that pruning process take place? What are God's pruning shears? Put it that way. And the answer is given in the next verse. Jesus says, You have already been cleansed by the word I have spoken to you. Interestingly, in these verses, we see two English verbs, prune and cleanse, but in the original Greek, it's the same verb that's used for both. And that verb, I think it's katharos, although I may be mispronouncing it. So actually, Jesus is saying here, you have already been pruned by the words that I've spoken to you. So what's God's pruning instrument? God's pruning instrument is the word of Christ. Jesus' teachings, or maybe more broadly speaking, the scriptures in general. And this reminds me of a well-known passage from the book of Hebrews. It says, Indeed, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Again, the holy scriptures, and perhaps more specifically the teachings of Jesus, are God's pruning shears, if you will. It's through our exposure to the word, it is through our engagement with the scriptures, it is through our obedience to their teachings that we grow in maturity as disciples. Which brings me to the next verse. Jesus says, abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. And I think that one way of abiding with Jesus so that we as branches can bear fruit is through studying the word. And that's something that you're doing right now. Congratulations. But if you're not doing this on a regular basis, I'd strongly recommend that you do so on a regular basis. Set aside some time each day, uh, you know, daily, to read from the word of God, to study the word of God. You can follow some set of readings. So we Anglicans use something called the Daily Office Lectionary. That's, uh, that's what I use, for example. Or you can read through a particular book of the Bible and, uh, and pick a, a particular chapter every day and just kind of work through the scriptures that way. And as you read, pray. My, my friend Mike uh, once said that the Bible is one of the few books that you can read with not only the presence of the author, but the help of the author as well. So pray as you're reading the scriptures. Ask for guidance. Ask for wisdom. Ask for understanding. In fact, many people, myself included, incorporate their daily scripture reading into their daily prayer routine. And prayer, of course, is another way in which we as branches can remain grafted to the vine. If you want to remain bound to Christ, then I would strongly suggest commune with him daily in prayer. And again, just like reading the scriptures, this is going to involve you intentionally setting aside time to pray. And I'm going to say this clearly, whether or not you feel like it. So let's say, for example, you want to designate first thing in the morning as your prayer time. Well, you know, your alarm may go off at, say, 6, 6.30 in the morning, and you might say, oh, I just want to sleep. But no, develop that discipline of getting out of bed and and, and brewing yourself a cup of coffee and cracking open your Bible and spending that time with God in prayer. Or if it's in the evening, you may say, oh, I'm so exhausted. I've spent the whole day at work. I just, want to, I just want to sleep. But again, it's so important that you discipline yourself to spend that time with God in prayer. I have to say that prayer is my lifeline. It's the most important thing that I do every day as a disciple of Jesus, and I, I cannot possibly live without it. Uh, as a branch, that's where I draw nutrients and life from the vine. Now, one last thing I want to say is this. If we as branches want to stay grounded um, to the true vine, what we need to do is also spend time in the Christian community. Be a part of a local expression of church. This is so important. 
I've had a lot of people tell me that they, they're disciples of Jesus, that they read the scriptures, that they have faith, but they don't want to be part of the church at all. And I understand how a lot of people have been burned by their experience of church. I totally get it. As a pastor of over 15 years, I know that unfortunately churches can hurt people. But I also know that Jesus is present in the church. And if we want to be close to Jesus, then we have to spend time with his disciples. We need to labor alongside our fellow disciples in, in serving the community, in proclaiming the gospel, etc. We need to be worshiping with our fellow disciples. We need to be in church, receiving the sacrament, participating in Bible studies, and hearing the word of God preached. Again, that's another way that we as branches stay grafted to that vine. And Jesus says that he is the true vine. If we as branches want to bear fruit, we need to stay grafted to him. We need to stay connected to him. And the fruit that we bear ultimately is the fruit of good works, the fruit of self-sacrificial love, the fruit of peace, the fruit of righteousness, the fruit of justice. And when people from the world see that, they see the kingdom of God, they see Christ, and that is a wonderful thing. Okay, so I'm going to end it there. Um, that marks not only the end of this particular Bible study, but uh, the, the, the Bible study that we've done over the course of the past few weeks on the I Am sayings of John's Gospel. If you have stuck with me to the very end, wow, congratulations. Um, I also have been told that there is a, a small church community in the UK that is using this as a Bible study. Um, I'm honored that you would even consider that. So on behalf of my congregation, here in uh, Canada, in Eastern Canada, I want to send my greetings. Our prayers are with you as you go about your ministry in your corner of the world. So thanks again for watching. Again, if you found this Bible study series to be a blessing to you, please leave a like. And if you want more from Stone Church, please subscribe. Thank you so much for watching and God bless.